worldwide environmental catastrophes like the recent oil spills, five years old children manufacturing our shoes, massive bonuses for managers who fail, misleading advertising, tight links between business and politics, ugly revelations on the world of finance. The public lost its trust in the business world. PricewaterhouseCoopers PwC has published a report called Trust the Behavioral Change in strong collaboration with Roger Steer, one of the lecturers I will always remember from my three years course here at CAS. Ask him how he contributed to this report and what it is about. The, the role I played in the PwC paper, Trust the Behavioral Challenge, was uh, twofold. One was to provide the core data that we're generating from the moral DNA profile and we have now 40,000 test results from people in over 160 countries. So that evidence base was absolutely crucial for the report. But also I worked with PwC to redevelop a clear understanding and interpretation of what this data was suggesting in the context of um, the loss of trust in business and the new settlement that's required between business and society. I would like the public to trust corporations, but it's down to the corporations primarily. Trust is often forgotten by companies. Um, it's forgotten because it's not easily measured with current international financial reporting standards, although clearly it's there in the market value of businesses. Um, and it's, it's only measured uh, really when things go wrong and the trust is destroyed because it affects market value. And we can see this most clearly in the in what happened to BP's share price after the Gulf of Mexico incident. My feeling is that unethical behaviour particularly arises when problems come and managers find that bribing government or hiding losses are the most efficient quick fixes. And that's partly because um, they're really not taught to stop and think. Um, the leadership is responsible for setting targets which are perhaps unrealistic or drove those behaviours. So one of the things we look at when we look at an organisation is to look at the environment within which managers are, uh, are working. And, and if their targets um, are driven towards 90-day reporting targets, yes. you know, then they're more likely to do the wrong thing. Are those companies really left with any choice but short-term thinking when they are listed on the stock market? I mean, one of the problems we've got is that the focus by the city, by investment banking analysts, on 90-day reporting, I think is fundamentally unhealthy. I think you should pay some attention to it, but nowhere near the weight of attention that we've seen over the, over the last 20 years. Before the banking crisis, HSBC was sold stock. Its performance was not maximised, its profit was not maximised, because it believed in creating a, a sustainable business model. On the other hand, RBS, which was clearly involved in the ABN AMRO merger and was involved in a very high level of sales-driven business, maximised short-term profit and the destruction was complete. Your moral DNA research outcome is really interesting because it shows that boards score really low on fairness, which is very alarming, isn't it? Um, yeah, they score low on humility. Mm. Um, so the higher up the organisation you go, the more arrogant you are. Or is it because you're more arrogant so you get higher up the organisation? That's one finding. And another finding is that um, the more senior you are, the less empathy you have with others, which fits in with our earlier statement about corporations really not being a place of belonging. Mm -hmm. Because if, if they were, then that would be because leaders had more empathy and considered the human consequences of their actions more. Um, when it comes to... Um, regulation for example the other thing we see about leaders is they have the lowest level of obedience yeah. so their ethic of obedience is the lowest and yet we think by changing rules of corporate governance we're going to change behaviors strangely enough you are against any additional regulation aren't you no I think we need some regulation uh, but I think we need it to be simple I think it, we need it to be clear and what I believe we we need it to be firmly enforced. Um, and if, for example, if you take the FSA regulation in the city, I honestly believe that you don't need the thousands of rules that are contained in the rule book mm. if people have a, a big conversation around what the 11 core principles for the FSA mean. One of them, for example, means treating customers fairly. Mm. 
well, I don't think it's for the FSA to decide what's fair, and they say they won't. It's not for the bank leadership team to say what's fair. It's for all of us who are part of those banks to decide what's fair. And you can also make that argument about the government cuts in public sector spending at the moment. So what is fair is not what you think is fair or I think is fair, it's what we agree is fair. It is very surprising to see in your research that those working in government have among the worst DNA scores. Uh, yeah, and local government is the lowest, central government is fourth quartile. And we believe that there's a link there to bureaucracy and a detachment from the consequences of our actions. That's part of the reason why there is a lot of talk around this so-called big society, which for me is a bad name. I think it should be called localism or mutualism, where in fact we should as individuals take responsibility for our for you know, uh, public services within our neighbourhoods because there we have much more, we are much closer connected to the decision makers and we can make our own views known. David Cameron congratulated you for your book. Is he truly different? My interaction with David and my observation of, of the way I see him thinking and acting is different. And, you know, he has, he has a disadvantage in that, you know, he can't help the fact he went to Eton and the fact he talks properly. Um, in an accent which most people find very upper class. But at the end of the day, he's highly intelligent. I think he's quite empathic. And I think he, you know, in the way he put together the coalition agreement in such a short time shows he's, he can also marry principle with pragmatism. The difficulty he has, I believe, is that he is operating within a fundamentally flawed system, which is, you know, one prime minister, one cabinet, one government, 600 MPs, trying to relate to 62 million Brits. It's not going to work. This crisis reveals some surprisingly high wages that shocked the general opinion and yourself. Yeah, I think, um, I think, there's, uh, I think that uh, excessive pay is an issue, but I think it's misunderstood. And the research we've done shows that men are motivated by status and ego. That's why they're more arrogant than women. And in fact, the tragedy is that men aren't so interested in what the money can buy them. They're more interested in it being a score of and a reflection of their status and success. And, you know, in my more humorous moments, I've said to boards, don't pay them another million dollars bonus. Just give them a medal. They'll be just as happy and it's a lot cheaper. Let's focus on banks. If top managers of banks in London don't get paid enough, they will move to New York or Hong Kong. Good. <laughs> because the other countries can have all the people who are bankers because they're greedy for more. I would prefer our banks to be run by people who do it because they believe in, in the profession they're involved in. And I think we get the bankers we deserve and the bankers we pay. And let's face it, the people who created the banking crisis are the very people who are moaning about not having excessive pay. If those companies start earning less money and very rich people start leaving the country, our GDP will massively decrease. Well, it'll, it will decrease. I'm not sure it will massively decrease. But already seeing leading economists like Joe, uh, uh, Joe Stieglitz and Noor Rabini in saying GDP is an insane measure anyway. We need to be actually factoring things like well-being and happiness into the way we measure the purpose of business and its out outputs. And I fundamentally agree with that. And I think if we have, we can create a fairer society, then our, our, if our, our new GDP, our ethical GDP, eGDP maybe we could call it, will increase dramatically. Can you think of a company that we should take as an example? I think that organisations which are mutuals or cooperatives are bound to be better. And in fact, the evidence suggests not only do they have higher levels of trust, um, their performance is also more stable. It may not peak in the same way that uh, a listed company would peak, but it actually does better during difficult times. So if you look at the performance of Nationwide and John Lewis during the recession, they've done very well. I mean, I've done a bit of work with Norton Rose, the law firm, and, and it was interesting when they had to cut their costs a year ago, rather than cut 10-15% of their staff, they had a ballot and all agreed to, to take a cut in salary to preserve the community. 
to preserve their place of belonging. Many thanks, Roger Steele. Thank you very much for watching this podcast and see you next time.